Well, welcome and good morning, everyone. Um, this is our Echo Clinic, uh, the pain management Echo Clinic, and uh, thank you all for uh, showing up. Uh, we, with the weather, we didn't know what we were going to get, but uh, we have a number of uh, guests here in the in the room. And Dr. Patterson, who normally joins me, I think is uh, with us via via the uh, video Skype or whatever you call that uh, with uh, the rest of you. So that's uh, wonderful. So. Um, I, I welcome you all uh, and uh, just invite you all to help me make this a, uh, a useful uh, hour, if you will, an uh, uh, interactive hour. Uh, the topic today is uh, sleep and, uh, and chronic pain. Um, again, a few other housekeeping things. Uh, Mr. Paul Snyder, who is another colleague where the trio, the pain management trio, is uh, at a conference today, so he won't be with us. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, I've got Dr. Patterson on the on the horn here or watching us. So, uh, welcome all, and uh, hopefully you're all warm inside your house or where your work is, and you got to work safely. Yeah, let's go around and have, have uh, everybody introduce our, themselves. So we'll start with everyone we have here in the room. I'm Troy Jorgensen. I'm the program coordinator here at Project Echo Nevada. Uh, your main point of contact if you have any questions or anything related to Echo. Uh, go ahead. I'm Dr. Suresh Kanan. A fellow in the hospice and palliative medicine program at the University of Nevada, Reno. And I'm Dr. Kelly Conright, um, hospice and palliative medicine fellowship director through the University of Nevada. Excellent. Um, and then, Alan, you want to go ahead? <laughs> okay, <laughs> and unmute. And I was, uh, never mind. I'm Alan Fisk. I'm here in Elko. I am here for some technical support. How's the snow out there today, Alan? Oh, it's just a dusting, and uh, it's warmed up a little. It's been quite cold, but uh, we're looking forward to a couple of days of warm weather anyway, with a little snow. Great. <laughs> um, and then we'll go over to Dr. Barry Cole. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Happy New Year to everyone. Good morning. Sorry. Thank you. And Don Vining. Don, could you take yourself off mute and introduce yourself, please? Yes, hi. My name is Dawn Vinning. I'm out of Porterville. I'm actually in school at uh, Lincoln Memorial University, and I'm uh, participating as a part of the class, but also as a uh, for myself to enhance my understanding of pain medicine, of pain, and pain management. Wonderful. Great to have you today. Thank you. And Nikki Bain, you want to go ahead? Um, I'm Nikki Bain. I'm nurse practitioner at the Battle Mountain Clinic in Battle Mountain. Great. Good to see you again. And Alice Swin. Hello, my name is Alice. I am transitioning into trying to get into UNR Med School, and I'm very much so interested in pain management. Wonderful. Great to have you again. And then, uh, Dennis, is that you called in? Yeah, that that is me that called in. So good morning, guys. Glad to be here. Sorry I couldn't make it in to be on the camera. No problem. We understand. <laughs> All righty. Um, so we'll open it up, see if anybody has any cases or questions that they want to ask right now. Um, so please feel free to take yourself off mute or write in using the chat box with anything you'd like to discuss. Cases are welcome. We love to discuss cases, and I have one at the end of today that I'll present. But uh, so, any Nikki, cases? Nikki, anything you want to talk about today? So, because all the people with pain had trouble sleeping, and then it's like, should you be doing sleep meds with pain meds? And so, I'm really interested in today's topic because everyone. Whether it's the pain keeping them awake or whether it's the just the psychiatric stuff that they can't, um, you know, they can't sleep or things. So I'm really interested in today's topic of whether we should use pain uh, sleep medications with pain medications and what we should we be using and all that sort of stuff. So this should be good today. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Yes. That uh, we, we will broach that topic, and uh, with that kind of as a stimulus here, it's important for you to know that uh, my background, I am a pain management psychologist. So uh, as a PhD psychologist, I don't prescribe meds, but uh, Dr. Patterson is here and uh, Dr. Cole, we've got a number of really uh, some good experts here who can 
perhaps respond more to the pharmacology of that. But uh, uh, my intention today is to kind of give a broad brush stroke of what sleep and chronic pain kind of is and some of the areas that I've uh, learned over the years that are important really to take a look at. So uh, yes, we welcome any questions about medications and, uh, and the implications of that for its impact on, on people with pain and sleep. So thank you all and uh, uh, I look forward to kind of making this uh, an interactive uh, uh, hour. So with that said, uh, let me, I was, I was thinking about this uh, early this morning as I would, before I woke up in a sense in a dream and I, I, I wanted to start with the idea that uh, you, we've all seen these uh, sleep mattress commercials where, where they have, they advertise the sleep number. Uh, what's your sleep number? And I thought, you know, that may be a useful kind of metaphor for us today, uh, because my intention is to really invite all of you, when you see a person with persistent pain, to absolutely try to ascertain their sleep number. What is it? What is their sleep number? And the, what my intention is with that, uh, you know, are they getting good quality sleep? Are they, are they getting the rest that they need? Are they getting all of the five sleep cycles? Uh, are they uh, benefiting from the from what how important sleep is and coexist and live with chronic pain? So my intention is to, in a sense, ask you guys questions about you know what you what you try to get, what data do you get about sleep? Because I would contend that besides uh, uh, that besides dealing with the actual pain, the next most important issue for for the vast majority of people with persistent pain is sleep sleep management how to and, 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 and assessing the quality or the sleep number of their of their pain uh, so my image is to have a little number you know a bubble over their head and ideally their sleep number is a hundred if you will which would be optimal healthy restorative sleep and I think uh, I wanted you to just start looking at people in that way uh, to determine my gosh this person you know may have a 43 score in their sleep number which means I really need to address this and, and that's really kind of one of the take home messages for today is that if you're dealing with people with persistent chronic pain, uh, in my humble opinion, it's a must to do the best sleep uh, assessment that you can. Uh, and the reason for that is that in my career, I've seen people who have been really stuck with a persistent pain problem. And when sleep is addressed at a perhaps more thorough and integrated level, they make some massive improvements uh, when they had, in a sense, had gotten stalled from a pain management standpoint, uh, not going anywhere. So it's kind of with that intention today that I hope to, to talk to you and share with you some ideas about pain and, and reasons why we really should take a look at pain and sleep in the context of people with pain. Um, let's see here. All right, Troy, thank you. Uh, left, right? Right. Okay, that one. Okay, uh, you know, just showing some of the various cycles of, of pain and, and what affects pain. There are numerous vicious cycles that occur when people have chronic pain, uh, and sleep is certainly part of it. Um, when people do have pain, uh, one of the major things that is affected is sleep. So uh, when people have pain and anxiety, it makes it harder for them to sleep. Um, and it, that, of course, comes back and kicks their physical pain and their energy levels. Um, it can create and add to anxiety. And we'll talk a little bit uh, later about some of the uh, behavioral, uh, cognitive behavioral insomnia techniques uh, that we use to help people uh, address pain from a, a psychosocial standpoint. And part of that is, is that they start to catastrophize and worry about the fact they're not gonna sleep. And now that then adds to, uh, it ensures an absolute terrible night's sleep on top of uh, what they were getting from their pain. So, uh, and it affects mood, uh, again, Similar to uh, sleep, um, the mood is impacted by pain. Uh, the number one mood that I've seen over my career, uh, separate from depression, uh, is frustration and anger uh, at having pain and not being able to remedy it. So these, these issues begin to then kind of compound inside the, your head in terms of your thinking before I go to sleep in anticipation of getting a, a, a bad night's sleep, so to speak. So... I'm going to have to try to, let's see here. I can follow along with you. Oh, okay. Bless yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, if that works, yeah. Okay. Um, so, 
Very common problem uh, with people with pain, uh, fatigue, lack of energy, uh, and non-restorative sleep. You know, people may get a, a few uh, uh, disrupted hours of sleep, but it's the quality of that sleep that also needs to be measured. And uh, one of my other take home messages here is uh, the importance of perhaps uh, getting a sleep uh, uh, study done on some of our patients. We'll get into that later. But, you know, fatigue, uh, and indeed, it's a, a major threat to quality of life when people are not getting the rest that they need. Uh, this is 50 to 80 percent, 88 percent of people with uh, chronic non malignant pain suffer from major sleep complaints. Troy, if you would, thank you. Um, so, you know, it's good for our health. Uh, I'll give you a little background. A number of years ago, about 10 years ago, because so many people that I had seen had sleep problems, I, I kind of partnered with a colleague here, Dr. Michael Lucia, who was a sleep medicine uh, colleague, and he um, provided a tremendous education for me with regards to uh, the importance of looking at sleep disorders. Uh, some of the more recent research that's coming out now is looking at the effect of uh, poor sleep on, on even the development and contribution to Alzheimer's and, and uh, dementia. Uh, and I think it, it gets back on a physiological level to uh, people who do not get even one night's good sleep, kind of builds the buildup of uh, amyloid beta and uh, tau uh, proteins uh, from just simply one night of bad sleep. Uh, and, and creates the plaques that I think we're looking at uh, that uh, may be a stimulus to the development later on in life of, uh, of, of significant uh, problems with Alzheimer's and dementia. So um, I think they're finding the value in, in making sure people get a good night's sleep to essentially cleanse the brain of the toxins that develop every day. And when people with chronic pain who go years without good sleep are getting all stages of sleep, this is a going to be a, a a build-up problem for later on in life. Um, so another, yet another reason to really take a look at helping people with sleep management uh, in addition to helping them deal with their pain problems. So um, again, this study I found fascinating and uh, uh, Dr. Lucia, again, I've got some other stuff that he has shared with me that I use as kind of a uh, part of the information of the rest of this presentation. So a good night's sleep is very, very important. Uh, for those with chronic pain and, and even those obviously without. Thank you, Troy. Okay, um, I have in my office this particular uh, diagram, and I, you can't see it well, but if I could show you, this is a poster that uh, I actually have in my uh, office, and uh, I just have it there just as a resource, but what I found extremely helpful is that uh, while perhaps I'm, if I'm getting things set up, and, and you can put these in, in uh, your various uh, uh, medical uh, offices, or, or the, uh, what am I talking about, the patient rooms, where patients are. It stimulates some very, very interesting conversations. Uh, and I, not to belabor it, but let me go over a few key points here. So it's an, it, it's an informative way to kind of start a discussion about the person's quality of sleep. Uh, this one basically shows how obstructive sleep apnea affects not only the person's pain experience, but all these other various organs and systems, uh, including cardiac arrhythmias, uh, congestive heart failure, hypertension, high blood pressure, the possibility of stroke, um, and uh, sexual dysfunction, GERD. And so I have found this extremely helpful to start the conversation, to be able to say, hey, you know, let's take a look and see you know, how your quality of night, how, how your sleep is, and the possibility uh, that if you do have obstructive sleep apnea, we probably need to do something about it. You know, it's not just snoring and it's kind of uh, an annoyance to your partner or to yourself. This actually has potentially life and death uh, implications. This is the one down here, huh, Mike? Uh, yes, the, and if you look at the bottom right, um, you know, up to 80% of people with fibromyalgia have sleep apnea. So, you know, we live in Nevada, it's a gambling town. Those are pretty high odds that uh, you probably want to take a look at the person's quality of sleep. So, with that said, if I may be so bold, uh, and I'm going to refer to my colleague and partner, Dr. Patterson here. When you meet a pain patient, Dr. Patterson, what, uh, uh, to, to, could you share with the rest of us what, what it is you look at in terms of sleep uh, and some of the questions you ask or how it's integrated into your day? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, definitely um, sleep is a big issue with a lot of these patients, and it'll be one of their 
one of their main complaints when you discuss, you know, how they can't get a good night's sleep and just never feel restored. And I think you're right. It's a, it's kind of a, a never ending cycle. You, you don't get sleep. You hurt more during the day. You do less, makes your pain worse and your function, you know, is totally decreased. And then the cycle starts all over again, um, you know, with another bad night of sleep. And as, and as I, 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 we've talked about this in the past, um, you know, there's that study where they took um, college students and they slept deprived them for about a week. And what they found is a lot of them developed chronic pain type symptoms that were uh, consistent with almost fibromyalgia type uh, conditions. And once they kind of restored their sleep cycle and let them get a good night's sleep, their pain complaints went away. And so a lot of times you're right, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg here? Did they have a pain complaint that led to the sleep problems or did the sleep problems lead to the chronic pain issue? And so I think it's very important to ask your patients about any ongoing sleep issues they may have. And a lot of times I'm, I'm now trying to make a, a referral to a sleep specialist to have them evaluated, do an overnight sleep study. And uh, interesting enough is there's a lot of resistance from patients who want to follow through with that recommendation. And, you know, honestly, I think it, it comes down to uh, this, is that they've seen their primary care, they've complained about it, they've been put on some sleep medication, and now the patient is reliant on that and thinks that's all they need and doesn't want to go get a, a thorough workup. And, and and so now I'm having a hard time getting them in to see a sleep specialist because, you know, to them, the solution is just taking a pill, not looking in to see if they have an underlying central or obstructive sleep apnea. Um, are you going to say something like? Yeah, no, I, I was going to tie into what you were saying. Uh, that, that study you, you noted with the fibromyalgia patients and the students, uh, this last, the one I cited earlier, uh, which suggests that not only do they start looking like and feeling like fibromyalgia patients, but they're actually beginning the buildup of these of these uh, proteins in the brain that if they're not, in a, in a sense, washed or cleansed with a good night's sleep, uh, could have problems down the road in terms of the buildup of those plaques for further problems. So, yeah, multiple reasons. And, and the other thing you mentioned, and this is true, uh, in my 35 years of, of seeing people with persistent pain, when I get to my uh, intake where I talk about sleep, um, it almost feels like uh, in some patients that they're somehow, in, it, it's an embarrassing question, like it's a personal hygiene thing if I ask them if they snore. Uh, you know, do you snore, you know, and, and it's kind of like, oh my God, no, I don't have body odor. Uh, so it, it is, there is that level, level of resistance to this topic. And I think we need to figure out ways to somehow try to get around that because if we let that be the barrier, we didn't go, don't go any further. We don't get their sleep number, if you will. Uh, we're missing a huge part of uh, their their pain management. So, correct. And a lot of times, what you know now with all the uh, black box warnings with medic, you know, uh, some of these medications that are benzo um, acting. To help restore sleep, you know, and the contraindication of them being on pain medications, uh, you know, a lot of times now, you know, I'm, I'm telling patients they got to come off these medications, and then it, from a pain management perspective, I'm trying to use sometimes some, uh, you know, sleep or, or I guess muscle relaxants that have sedative type effects to help them sleep, which I know are going to be safer um, than combining, you know, a benzo type sleep aid with with pain medications. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of resistance to that, you know, patients, you know, want to prove me wrong that these, you know, other medications or things aren't going to help. Um, and, and, you know, they're almost going to personally try to fail, I guess, is what, you know, what I've seen, like, they don't, they don't want to succeed with other types of medication. And to be honest, I, you know, it, it comes down to, you know, when we've had Michael Lucia in the past is that sleep aids are not the solution. It's working up the pain problem and working on, you know, more behavioral health techniques um, uh, to manage sleep than it is to throw a pill. A pill, a, a, you know, a pill is not the solution. Yeah, especially if, if they have obstructive sleep apnea or central sleep apnea. It, it'll only exacerbate the problem. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, any, anybody else? I, I, so the question is, how do you assess sleep with your 
persistent pain patients? What, what do you do? How do you, how deep do you go? And maybe that's based on your specialty, but. A uh, question here from Nikki. What about the tricyclic antidepressants, antidepressants to help at night? Uh, great question. Um, you know, my experience, and again, I'm speaking as a psychologist, has been sometimes those medications have three benefits, uh, depending on the type you're using. The, uh, sometimes they offer um, the, the benefit of uh, addressing neuropathic pain. Um, sometimes they can become sedating to help facilitate sleep. But again, I raise the question, maybe that's not the problem with the sleep. Um, and sometimes it has, uh, they have antidepressant effects. Um, so yes. in some cases, I, I've seen a benefit of that, but that's where I end on that question. Dennis, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree, Mike. I mean, so if I'm looking at, uh, <clears throat> you know, alternatives to, you know, like Ambien or taking Lorazepam or something like that at bedtime, I mean, TCA, uh, uh, TCA is not a bad alternative. And I think you, you nailed it on the head. I mean, it, it can give several things to help the, the chronic pain patient. One, you know, if they have some, you know, 70% of all chronic pain patients have some type of depression. And if you can put a low dose PTA at night, that can help out. Two, you're, you're absolutely right. These medications have side effects. And a lot of times it's a sedating type of side effect. Um, so, you know, they'll just sleep off the side effects if you put them on, you know, at bedtime. And then two or three, the neuropathic pain, um, uh, how they can help that, those types of patients, is perfect. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to, to low-dose TCAs at bedtime to help my chronic pain patients get a good night's sleep. Good. Uh, uh, here's a request. Let, uh, what I'd like to do, since I know there's probably a lot of questions about medications, let me get through my, my presentation and slides because I don't really talk about medications, and I do know that's something the audience wants to talk about. But let me kind of allow me to make my point with the rest of my slides, and then I'd like to reserve some time for some questions on, on uh, types of medications. Troy, if you could go down two slides to where I get to my questions. Uh, th yeah, this information is just kind of how it affects, how pain affects sleep, stuff you probably already know. If you can go to the next one, the next one after that. Okay, these are some of the questions that, as, that I utilize and, and I would encourage you to take a look at uh, in terms of your assessment of sleep. Um, whether or not they've had any kind of sleep problems in the past is, a, is an important question. Um, what time do they go to bed? Is, uh, what time do they wake up? Uh, here I'm just looking at, is there a routine? Do they have a, a regular time? Because one of the big sleep hygiene issues is that people have erratic times when they go to bed, they have erratic times when they wake up. And then the question about sleep onset. I ask them, how long does it normally take you to fall asleep? And I think rule of thumb is if it's anything beyond 10, 12 minutes, we now have a sleep onset issue uh, as a problem. Um, I ask questions about interruptions in, uh, in their sleep, and, and I uh, leave that open. I said, you know, I don't say is it because of just pain, but do you have any other, other interruptions? It could be they have a dog on the bed that frequently has to go to the bathroom three to four times a night or something, or there's noises. Uh, so I ask, is it, uh, you know, is it pain related that you have interruptions? Most people, of course, say yes, but you may uncover some other interesting uh, problems that interrupt their sleep. Sleep duration, of course, is important. Uh, many people with, that I do of L say, well, uh, you know, I add up all the minutes, it's interrupted. And I said, please, yeah, you know, how many hours of total sleep did you have before you develop pain? How many would you say you have now? 90% of the people have a decrease in the sleep duration. Um, also, asking about daytime napping is important. Uh, many people will refuse to nap in the daytime. Others say, no, I have to. Um, and that could be also an indication of not getting a good night's sleep. Um, I asked the question about snoring, but interestingly enough, as I've learned, there is a subset of people who do not snore who can have moderate to severe apnea and obstructive sleep issues. So snoring in and of itself is not the holy grail of defining any kind of an apneic problem. Um, people who don't snore still can have it. Um, and you know, the key there too is they may say, well, I don't know. And then you simply ask, well, does your, if your partner were here, would they say you snore? And sometimes they go, oh, yeah, you know, they're really, they, they can't, they sleep in another room. Um, I look for headaches in the morning. 
Uh, frequently, uh, uh, people who wake up with a lot of headaches, uh, again, from an obstructive sleep apnea standpoint, their O2 levels are going down. They're not breathing. And without the oxygen, the brain begins to starve and they, they, get, they have daytime headaches. Um, I would encourage you to observe neck circumference uh, as one of the variables. I think a 17 inch neck for a male or greater would be an anatomical indicator of the possibility of apnea because you've got a lot of soft tissue there. And I think it's, uh, maybe it's 19 for men and 17 for women um, as, a, as a variable to look at to, to identify their sleep number, if you will. Um, the jaw, the location of the jaw, retracted jaws, greater likelihood of possibility of, uh, of breathing problems. Um, I also ask if they've had their wisdom teeth removed. Sounds weird, but uh, with the removal of wisdom teeth, especially in the jaw, that also adds the uh, possibility of the jaw being retracted further in a, in a, a reclined position, adding to the possibility of obstructive sleep apnea. Um, nocturia. Uh, uh, frequently, I, I miss this question, but uh, you know, ask people, getting back to interruptions in your sleep, what, is it to go to the bathroom? Uh, I found a number of people who will say, oh yeah, I, I go to the bathroom three, four times a night. And that's interesting in and of itself. The next question though, perhaps is more definitive. If, if you could ask them, how much do you avoid when you go to the bathroom? And they, they usually cock their head and go, what do you mean? I said, how much do you, you know, is your normal amount of urine or is it a smaller amount? And many times I get people say, yeah, you know, you, now that I think about it, it's like a, it's a thimble full. Well, that could be a really good indication. It's not a urinary issue. It's more of a obstructive sleep apnea issue. Um, I, I did this last time I gave this uh, uh, talk, and I'm going to do it again. Um, does anybody out there know what a malinpotty score is? Got a hand here. We've got a hand here? <laughs> oh, okay. We've got a hand here. Okay, great. How do you do? Uh, tell us, what is a malinpotty score? Uh, it's pretty much grading on a class of uh, one to four, whether or not how much of the airway you can actually visualize just by your eyes, usually grading by the... Excellent. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like the, if you can visualize the full uh, uvula and, uh, and uh, what is it, soft palate, then you've got a class one, class around three or four is if you see the base of the, the uvula, and four is pretty much all obstructed. Outstanding. Good job. You get it. Troy, give him a book. <laughs> Excellent. Actually, next slide. This is exactly what he's, uh, he's, he nailed. Here's what it looks like if you look into someone's mouth and throw it, as you described it very well. Uh, the problem is towards the right. When you see very little, if any, opening, this is a four score on the Malinpati scale. And it is, it should be a variable contributing to your overall sleep number. Okay. This decreases the sleep number unless you're in class one, which would be a higher, in, in my opinion, using that, that metaphor, you know, a better sleep number score. So malapotty, now as a psychologist, this is where I can't really kind of, I'm not doing a physical exam asking people to look in their mouth, but you certainly can. And uh, can, has anybody, tell me anybody, uh, the last time they did a malapotty test, has anybody done this or looked at them? Uh, we, yeah, okay, we have two here in the in the uh, in the, in the conference. But uh, uh, to, uh, how did that work for the last people? Did you get valuable information? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. And, and in the case of more class four, class one. It was class one. They were class one. Okay. <laughs> so good. So their sleep number was 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 higher because of the airway not restricted. Good. Super. Any questions? Okay, let me go to the next. This, uh, this is a, uh, uh, a document that uh, Dr. Michael Lucia put together, and it's, uh, it's been very helpful. I, it's not something I do, but I encourage you to take a look at it. We can get you copies of this if you'd like. Uh, just contact Troy, yep. we'll get that done. But if you look at it, and this is intended for people, uh, it's seven uh, risk factors, and it's kind of a screening for people who do say they snore. So uh, the first one there, you score a point if the patient snores loudly on most nights, greater than three times a week. Then you ask kind of the, uh, the bed partner or colleague, does there any witnessed apnea in the patient? That scores another point. Um, you take a look at uh, any daytime sleepiness or fatigue. 
And I'll show you in a second a uh, Epworth sleepiness scale, which we also have available that you can use to score daytime sleepiness. Uh, that would be the third variable. The fourth, if their BMI is greater than 30, and um, so if, if there's more adipose, if there's more tissue essentially there, that increases the risk for uh, in snores for having apnea. Uh, and then, of course, number five is the mal malin body score. That scores a point. Uh, we have neck size, you can see there. Actually, I'm, I was wrong. It was 17 inches for a men and 16 for a woman. Uh, then, in, in terms of medical history, any comorbidities, you can just see there if uh, they have atrial fibrillation, hypertension, stroke, that scores a point. And at the very bottom there, if they score four or more, that's uh, definitely recommended to send someone to a board certified sleep specialist. So uh, here is a tool that you can use in your practice fairly quickly to ascertain whether there's a possibility of any kind of apnea condition in your patient. Um, great, Troy. Okay, next slide. So this is the upward sleeping scale. Very quick, very easy. Basically, what are your chances of dozing on a zero to three scale when you're, as you go through these, I won't go through all of them, but sitting and reading um, all the way down to, uh, which is kind of a scary thought, in a car stopped at a traffic site, but assuming you're, you're a passenger. But the higher the score here, the greater the likeliness that you, uh, indeed, you have a chance of dozing and possible uh, daytime sleepiness fatigue, which is a contributor to the overall assessment for, um, for apnea. Um, second slide here, this just talks about you know, the breakdown of that. Uh, okay, so there's two types of apnea, obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea. Um, what I'd like to do, if I could here, let's just look at these. So obstructive sleep apnea is you can't breathe normally because of upper airway restriction. In contrast to that, central sleep apnea occurs because your brain isn't sending a signal that says the muscles to, to prompt them to start the process of breathing. Uh, central sleep apnea is definitely less common than obstructive. Um, however, in a, our pain population who receive opiates, central sleep apnea, I think, is certainly a rule out and it is much more common. So medications can affect central sleep apnea, the opiate class being the primary. Um, Troy, could we possibly show that sure, video? Yeah, I have a quick little video uh, just to kind of uh, add to the presentation format here that uh, it's very basic, but it, it just, it, talks about, it's actually done from Respironics, which is a CPAP, or a company that provides that. And I just to kind of give you a little uh, background on that. What happens in people with OSA is that the tongue and soft tissues in the airway relax during sleep. When the tongue and tissue totally obstruct the airway, it prevents fresh air from reaching the lungs, despite efforts to breathe. The oxygen content in the blood goes down, the brain recognizes that there's a problem, and it briefly arouses the body from sleep just enough to open the airway. It also stimulates the heart to beat faster and the blood vessels to constrict to send blood and oxygen to the vital organs. Regular breathing is restored, but the cycle repeats itself, sometimes up to a hundred times a night. Sleep apnea is usually treated with positive airway pressure, more commonly known by the acronym PAP, or PAP. PAP devices provide a gentle stream of air through a nasal mask to keep the airway open during sleep. So you, you see here, uh, if, if I could, I go back to my question about asking about nocturia. So the person who gets up four times a night to go to the bathroom, who thinks that they have to go to the bathroom and that's the reason, uh, indeed, their body's trying to arouse them and they try to make sense of that and they go, oh, this must be a, a urinary issue. So um, a very basic kind of a presentation there on what, what the apnea is. Um, great. Next slide, Troy. Okay. So apnea means loss of breath for 10 seconds or longer. Uh, hypopnea is a partial loss of breath that lasts 10 seconds or longer. Uh, the index of uh, apnea, hypopnea, AHI, you, you typically hear or see. Um, you're looking at basically a, a normal level, uh, considered normal would be fewer than five per hour, um, five to 14, mild all the way up to severe, which is 30 or more events per hour. Um, uh, so when you get a sleep study, uh, this is what they will effectively give you uh, as an AHI number and, and along with a lot of other uh, data. 
the bless you the the issue that I see I mean it Something's better than nothing. But what, what, what I've seen in this community now is instead of formal uh, sleep studies done overnight, um, many insurance companies are only paying for take-home studies. And uh, they do not do the same quality of evaluation as those that are done in a lab overnight. But this is probably the structured approach to medicine where they go at the least up to the most. But um, uh, unfortunately, a take-home sleep study uh, does not give some of the data that uh, we really need to get a more thorough sleep study. That's just an editorial opinion. But this is what an AH means, and this is what your patients will get after they have a formal sleep study. Um, typically, um, CPAP can come as a treatment from usually moderate, certainly for severe, uh, but I have had some patients uh, put on CPAP with help, even in the mild ranges. There are other treatments, and we'll talk about that next, if you would. Okay, uh, actually, I have this slide a little different here, so maybe we can talk about medications, as I mentioned, I'll get, have enough time here, but it is certainly the most widely used treatment for sleep disturbances, even though long-term you know, efficacy has not been established. And we actually can create problems by writing the script for a sleep med, especially if it's used long-term. Uh, and there's many people out here in the audience that, are, that have more experience with that than I do, but we can, I wanna make sure you have enough time to, we can talk about that. So next slide, Troy. So here's what drugs, uh, how they affect sleep. Uh, basically, uh, let me direct your attention to the benzodiazepine withdrawal acute section. So we've got, uh, here's how you read this. There's a decrease in total sleep time with, with benzos. Um, sleep latency is decreased. Um, you can see the wakefulness after sleep onset, or the WASO goes down. Very important, REM sleep is down and stage two sleep increases with uh, uh, spindles. Uh, the one takeaway that I have from this is that, again, medications have a price. There's a cost for anything you take. And when you just look at benzodiazepines in this slide, uh, they're impacting your sleep. Most people with chronic pain, persistent pain that I work with who had sleep studies, they have a lot of stage two sleep. In fact, many of them, that's all they get. Um, and I, I go back to my earlier study, which suggests that with poor sleep, we have the increase in these proteins that may lead to plaque formation in the brain. The brain is not flushed and cleansed daily, and we may now have a problem down the road in terms of uh, uh, Alzheimer's issue. But, but again, that's speculation. There. But, uh, next slide, Troy. I just wanted to show you also what opiates do. So opiates also decrease lens, uh, REM sleep. Um, they do tend to hold people asleep longer, but uh, uh, there are a number of obviously long-term problems with opiates, uh, including its effect on central sleep issues. Next slide, Dre. So um, basic education about uh, sleep and the nature of that and what causes insomnia should be discussed. We have many uh, mental health professionals uh, that are trained specifically in cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Uh, the research is very good. Um, some of the behavioral techniques we have are very helpful. Um, and next slide there, Troy, if you would. Um, some key strategies, again, just some ideas that you could perhaps share with patients uh, in that meeting. Um, strengthening the association between bed and sleep. Um, that basically is, don't, let's not have a TV in the room. Let's not be listening to music necessarily. Let's make the bed and, and your bedroom associated with falling asleep quickly. Ideally, avoiding naps uh, would increase the likelihood that you'd be tired to go to bed. Some simple things like many people go to bed because it's uh, 10 o'clock at night. They may not be sleepy. That may be setting the stage then for the development of catastrophic thoughts because they can't fall asleep. And now we see kind of a cascade effect on uh, future problems with sleep. Um, you know, establishing a pre-sleep routine um, another big one is getting out of bed. If you cannot fall asleep within 20 minutes, the idea there is that we don't want to increase frustration. We don't want to increase the uh, likelihood that uh, people will start catastrophizing about sleep. So getting people out of the bed, leaving that area, and only coming back to bed when they begin to feel tired and sleepy, enhancing the likelihood of quick sleep is what, is what we're after. Uh, next slide, Troy. So these are some of the key strategies, sleep restriction, relaxation training, sleep hygiene education, 
Um, sleep restriction is an interesting one, uh, but maybe we can talk about that, that later. It's very effective, but most people don't like doing it. Essentially, what you do is you ask them how many, to do a kind of an analysis, how many minutes they actually sleep in the course of the night. Uh, some people will say, I sleep three hours, four hours. Then you tell them, you ask them, what time do you wake up? 6 a.m. You say, okay, here's the deal. Four hours from 6 a.m., you've got to stay up till 2 in the morning before you go to bed. You're restricting their sleep. The idea is they'll be exhausted at 2 in the morning. They tend to fall asleep quickly, and they may get their four hours of sleep. Uh, but there's a lot of resistance to that because people can't stay up, you know, usually. But it is very effective in those patients who, who can. Next slide, correct? Thank you. Um, okay, OSA, treatment. Key things, lose weight, avoid alcohol, sleeping pills, uh, change, changing sleeping positions to improve breathing. Uh, sleeping on your back, for many of us, is the worst thing in the world. That really forces the gravity to close off the airway. Um, smoking, huge. Uh, but, you know, we try to get people to stop smoking for every other reason, too. Um, and then CPAP, uh, a very effective treatment. Um, a, on a personal note, uh, eight years ago, I had a sleep study done because I wanted to see what that experience was like. I was diagnosed with an AHI of 45. And uh, it fit because I had morning headaches. I had all the problems listed. Got on CPAP. I've been on it religiously every day literally since since that time and uh, the estimates are that I've probably added five years to my life with the reduced risk from just using that CPAP and there's a joke amongst us with CPAP machines and that is uh, if you had a pick between your spouse and the CPAP machine it would be it would be an easy choice and, and the machine would win <laughs> but anyways and they also have surgery for apnea there's dental devices but we'll get into that next slide Troy uh, okay, central sleep apnea. This is the one that is uh, usually exacerbated by opiates. Um, address any associated medical problems, reduct, reduce opiates. Uh, CPAP is also potentially beneficial. Uh, and again, look at supplemental oxygen if that's the issue uh, and, and review medications. Next slide, Troy. Okay, uh, I have a case presentation, but what I'd like to do since we're down to about 10 minutes left, uh, I'd like to talk to you about this, but um, I'd like to open up the pharmacology of uh, sleep, and uh, if, if you would uh, have perhaps Dr. Patterson respond to that, perhaps Dr. Cole, um, or any of the wonderful guests we have here. So any questions on sleep medications? The use of, the problems with, the benefits of? Oh, I, I do have a comment about you. You had listed various medications and the effects on I sleep. Think. And from a geriatrics perspective, a commonly used medication is antihistamines, for example, diphenhydramine, also known as Benadryl. And they're starting to become a known association with the use of that in dementia. Interesting. So yeah. you might add that to your list. Thank of you. Thank you. Excellent observation. Yeah. Um, I've got another comment on the Benadryl. If people tend to have restless legs. That makes them more jumpy at night, and yes. often it makes it worse. So I often recommend people, older people particularly, don't use Benadryl and things. But another point I wanted to make on the sleep, it's not only the chronic pain people, but um, the orthopedic, you know, that had joint replacements, and the orthopedic doctors send them home, they've got to lie on their back in bed and you know, whatever replacement they've had. And those people just about get knocked by about six weeks. They're not sleeping, they think the pain's out of control. Um, you know, they, they've usually got plenty of pain medication from the orthopedic doctor, but they're just not sleeping. And so that is causing increased pain and then just not getting over the joint replacement so I think sleep is so you know and everything is important but you know it's often they're not chronic pain but the long-term pain because of the surgery yeah I, I had a knee replace total knee replacement two years ago and uh, besides the discomfort of that and uh, it was sleep that was a, a major issue I, it was very difficult to turn over in bed with the knee and you're constantly waking up so but fortunately, I had a CPAP machine, which really did help me get uh, better night's sleep. So uh, I'm glad I had that identified 
earlier. Yeah, excellent. And uh, a comment on the restless lakes. I, I learned this also that there's an interesting difference between restless lake syndrome and periodic lake movements. Periodic lake movements tend to come on a periodic basis, usually uh, at night, and it's a, a jumping kind of a, a situation. Um, restless lakes, I have found, uh, my restless lakes, which I had, uh, was to, has been treated very effectively with, uh, 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 with magnesium, an over-the-counter magnesium. Uh, and again, not being a physician, uh, but I was, I was recommended that from actually Dr. Michael Lucia made a world of a difference. So my less restless legs problems, and that's a major issue in terms of sleep. You can't sleep when your legs are jumping kind of on an intermittent basis. So very good point. Great. Any other questions, Pharmaco pharmacological questions? So let me end here then with this case presentation. So uh, gentleman, 55 years old, uh, he has chronic pain. He's had pain for a long time. He comes in, he's got shortness of breath. He's gained weight, actually 10 pounds is probably an underestimate. He's gained probably more like 40 pounds, uh, due in part to inactivity from the pain. Um, he's tired throughout the day, he's fatigued, he's sleepy, he's dozing off. So you can imagine what his uh, Epworth sleepiness scale scores would be. Uh, interestingly, of course, we don't look at sleep as the problem. We think that it's other things, and in fact, you know, she, uh, wife thinks that if he just loses weight, he would be better. And in fact, weight loss is a very important part of this, this case presentation. Uh, the reason I put it up here is that it isn't just weight loss. That isn't the primary problem here. Uh, it's a secondary problem. He had a history of childhood asthma, um, but hasn't really had many uh, worsenings of that as an adult. Um, he has other comorbid uh, kind of medical problems, diabetes, um, he, he's uh, in, non-insulin dependent, but he has hypertension. Uh, he did quit smoking, uh, which was good. Um, but, you know, this gentleman also urinates four times a night, the nocturia, and uh, he had minimal uh, voiding. So made a referral to a sleep medicine specialist and had a study done. His AHI, mine was 45, his was 106. and had central sleep apnea in addition to obstructive sleep apnea. He is now on a BiPAP machine. This gentleman, uh, I've been seeing for a number of years, persistent pain patient, he started a month ago, and his spouse said he's a different person. He's on a BiPAP machine. He's a different person. He has more energy, um, and he's one of the few people that after the first night's use of uh, the BiPAP felt wonderful which predicts his continued use of this, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, tool. So look for these people. So kind of a, in a summary, uh, I invite you to think of your persistent pain patients and think of that commercial. What would this person's sleep number be? If it's bad and, it looks, and some of these issues are there, they may have a lousy sleep number, a low number. We want to raise their sleep quality number to 100%. And ideally, looking at these issues, taking a good evaluation, getting a referral to a, a sleep medicine clinic, identifying a problem. It's made a huge difference in my patients when, in, when it feels like I'm at a roadblock and I don't know what else to help them with. And they love it. They really appreciate it. And when it's all said and done, they say, wow, I, I'm a lot better. I still have pain and I'm sleeping a lot better. And to me, that's priceless. So. Any other comments, uh, thoughts? This presentation was very insightful. I'm definitely going to look into making sure I evaluate my patients more in depth on sleep in the pain, with the pain. Wonderful. I appreciate that. And and thank you. Thank you. That was the intention. Increase awareness. Any other questions or comments out there? So um, I would encourage you all to get something like this. In fact, if you could get this, it's from Rotec, and uh, it's something that would be really interesting if you set up in your, uh, in your exam offices, have one of these in each room. When you walk in then, now they're a little sensitized to, hey, what is obstructive sleep apnea? And like I said, 80% of my patients I've seen over the last 35 years 
have sleep issues. And many of them end up diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea or central apnea. Well, thank you all. Um, have a great week. I think we're back in uh, two weeks, Troy? Um, three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, because, uh, yeah. We're back in three weeks. February 6th will be that date. Um, and I'm not sure of the topic, but hope yeah. to see you there. Wonderful. Thank you all for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki.